Okay. Okay, great. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Jonathan Weinert, as Jacob said, and welcome to the Gates Carbon Drive webinar. Um, and I'd like to just start off by thanking you for making time in your day to attend, uh, especially given strange, turbulent times that we are in. And whatever you're thinking or feeling about these times, I hope we can all agree on one thing. The bike is a great tool for physical, mental, and also planetary health, which is perhaps more important now than ever. Um, so today, we're going to talk about bikes. We're going to talk about bike drivetrains, and we're going to talk about what Gates is doing to contribute to this amazing 150-year-old and still going strong invention. But first, it's my great honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, Zach Krapfel. And uh, I'm just the opening act. Um, I'm going to cover who's Gates, uh, industry trends, and this uh, long-time techno battle of the century, belt versus chain. Um, and then Zach is going to take over for part two to talk about uh, brand new Gates products that are hitting the market very soon. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Zach for seven years, but he's been a prime player in the bike and e-bike industry for decades. And when Zach is not dreaming up new de bike designs like the one you see here, which is a crazy cargo bike um, that he rides all over Colorado and takes to trade shows from time to time. Uh, and he built this himself as well. He's also giving TEDx presentations about the benefits of cycling, uh, which you can see here on the right. So um, Zach, uh, really looking forward to your presentation. Um, okay, and um, just, just one other thing, in terms of audience participation, as Jacob touched upon, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, but feel free to ping us throughout the presentation. Ping us in the chat room. Zach, Jacob, and I will all be monitoring it throughout the presentation, and we'll try to provide you some real-time answers. Uh, okay, so um, now, uh, begin with the presentation. For those of you that are not familiar with Gates, I uh, just wanted to give you a brief introduction to who we are, where we are. Uh, we specialize in power transmission belts and sprockets and pulleys, along with fluid power transmission components like hydraulic hoses and couplers. Um, you can see on the bottom here, we're active in many segments of the economy, but today we're really gonna focus on this one segment here that you see highlighted, personal mobility. And, uh, next slide here is, <clears throat> where is Gates? So we're made up of 15,000 employees throughout 120 countries. You can see on this slide some of the headquarters uh, globally listed on this map. We have plants churning out belts, hoses, and drive pulleys throughout many of these countries. And Denver, Colorado is our home. It's our world headquarters. Um, okay. And... Uh, just a little bit about the personal mobility business that I mentioned. To us, personal mobility, it means two wheelers of all shapes and sizes and energy sources from gasoline to electric to human power and even some power sport vehicles like UTVs and ATVs. And for each of these segments, we provide the products that you see on this top line and those products are backed by decades of material science research and development, um, which you see on the second line. And we have an extensive application engineering team that integrates these technologies into different vehicle platforms that you see on the left. Overall, we're focusing on advancing how the world moves through drive system solutions. And this is just an example of some of the customers that we're proud to work with from all over the world. Uh, one last slide about our history. We started transforming mobility way back in 1911 with a, a new rubber tire tread, uh, which replaced, replaced leather tire treads. And that led our founders, the Gates brothers, 
to invent the world's first V-belt for cars, which really transported us into this power transmission world. Uh, fast forward to 1980, we developed the first belt to replace chains on motorcycles. And then 14 years ago, we launched Gates Carbon Drive that to bring that same uh, innovation to bicycles. Uh, okay, so that's a little bit about our history and, and where we come from to introduce ourselves to all you that uh, I believe we have a, a very international audience today, um, several, several from Europe, probably a few from, from Asia, <laughs> and um, quite a few from North America as well. Uh, but let's turn our attention to the topic at hand. What is changing in the industry, especially related to drivetrains? And to do that, it's helpful to look back in time at one innovation from 140 years ago that transformed the bike world. And that was the chain. And it was invented by Hans Reynold, and it totally made the, the penny farthing, which was the, the main, you know, the, the big wheel in front, the small wheel in the back. It was a direct drive. It killed that vehicle, and it brought out it brought into the world this this bike that you you could recognize today as as the the modern day bicycle uh, and a more accessible, comfortable, safe bike design. <clears throat> uh, okay, but let's also look at the history of the belt in two wheelers. Okay, also very long history, and it started prior to 1900 using leather for these um, very sort of primitive motorcycles. Um, and uh, belt drives were brought to motorcycles in the 80s. First polyurethane belt drive on a motorcycle pictured here. And then not long after, they were brought to bicycles. And what you see here is 40 years later, these are still the main two technologies battling for drivetrain supremacy. And up to very recently, chain has been by far the dominant technology for bicycles. However, as I'll show in the next few slides, the playing field is start to tilt towards belt. And I will stop my video and just focus on the slides from here on out. Okay, so. Um, and uh, so what's, what, sometimes it's, sorry, John, just had sometimes a little slow in that share application, I believe. So that might be what's going on there, but it'll, it'll come through eventually. Okay. Um, all right. So new trends in personal mobility market. Three things are changing in this market. Uh, first being people have been increasingly crowding into cities, driving up congestion and demand for due to congestion, they're, they're demanding alternatives to cars, which has contributed to growth in the second bullet point, micro-mobility options. And these micro-mobility options may be shared, they may be owned personally, some are pedal powered, but increasingly more are electric. And that's the third market trend point. Uh, electric due to improvements in battery and motor technology and also driven in part by air quality regulations. And due to those three trends, we're seeing three key changes in bicycle drivetrains. First being increasing use of internally geared hubs. They are great for commuting and touring due to their high durability and low need for maintenance. Second, we're seeing increasing power and torque from uh, more and more mid-drive motors. Um, and then uh, third, due to both of these innovations, we are seeing a, a transition from chain to belt drive. Okay, so to put a little bit of data behind some of these um, claims, I wanted to show you this chart, which... Um, I just wanted to let you take a look at our view of the total two-wheeler market and share of electrification in each segment. Uh, so you see bicycle, scooter, and motorcycle. Um, electrification 
as you can see in, the, in this left bar, it's well underway in the bicycle space. So roughly 14% of over 100 million bikes sold per year are electric. And we are projecting that by 2025, one in three bikes sold will come with some form of electric motor. Um, we, we already see this today in the Netherlands and Germany. And um, I think B Belgium is actually one in two bikes sold now uh, with the highest rate of electrification. Uh, okay, now let's get back to that technology battle for the bicycle drivetrain, belt versus chain. Here is our assessment of how belt and chain rank according to key attributes that are valuable to bike customers. Um, the top three advantages that you see here in this chart, noise, durability, life, and maintenance, um, those are probably the three most distinct advantages where belt really shines. Um, it also has some advantages in efficiency, uh, weights, belt versus chain, nearly neck and neck. Um, but to be fair, the chain also has some very strong properties as well, which has given it incredible staying power for over 140 years, as mentioned before. And those key points are installed cost and ease of bike frame design since a chain can be split. And I'll go into many of these uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, and the, finally, though, when we look at the total cost of ownership over the life of the bicycle, we think Belt has an upper hand. And I'll, I'll give you some of the data behind these evaluations. So first, let's look at maintenance. And what you see here in this chart is a comparison of a standard chain on a commuter bike, standard chain on a mountain bike, and a belt drive, and you see the, the values for how often you need to clean all three, lubricate all three, replace, both for pedal bikes and for e-bikes. Of course, uh, chain, the manufacturer's recommendations are to clean and lubricate it roughly 150, every 150 miles, um, even more frequent if you're mountain biking. Um, you can see the replacement frequency is about 2,000 um, 2, kilometers. And on an e-bike, which has much higher torque uh, going through the drivetrain, which stretches the chain out, um, wears it quicker, it's, it's about half of that in, in our experience. And um, it's, it's even more aggressive for mountain bike. And I want to show you on the very right how belt compares in terms of uh, rep replacement frequency um, with some of the assumptions listed uh, below. Uh, next, I wanted to touch on the efficiency comparison of belt versus chain. Um, in a very recent test, which is hot off the press from our European distributor, Universal Transmissions, they uncovered a very interesting phenomenon for chain efficiency versus belt efficiency. And what this chart shows is that um, in the beginning, what, what they did in this test, they tested a new belt versus new chain, uh, a worn belt versus worn chain, and highly worn belt versus highly worn chain. And what they found was that in the beginning, chain has a slight advantage over belt, about 0.5% efficiency. However, over time and through increasing wear and tear, the chain gives up its high efficiency faster than the belt. So that at 200% wear, belt is basically showing a three to 4% advantage, or sorry, two to 3% advantage over chain. Um, okay, so moving on to the next point. And to be fair, I'd pointing out the biggest advantage the chain has over belt, which explains its very high market share. Uh, I think it's um, after 140 years of innovation and um, high um, uh, scale of economies, uh, economies of scale, it has a very low installed cost and also very few, uh, no, no real frame design requirements, um, which you can see in this slide. Uh, Belt, on the other hand, requires uh, the frame has a certain minimum stiffness, a certain alignment between the front and rear sprockets. Uh, it requires a rear triangle split to put the belt in for the first time since the belt doesn't break or you don't split it. 
um, and it requires dropouts or an idler for tension adjustment. And, and these, these adjustments, along with the cost differential between belt and chain, basically leads to at retail, if you're going to buy a bicycle, one with belt, one with chain, both with uh, internally geared hub, could lead to a, a MSRP difference of 200 to $300. However, as mentioned before, this low total cost of ownership gives belt an advantage in the long term. Um, so we, we talked about some of the key advantages of belts, and I mentioned one of its strongest points is durability. I think it's helpful to, to take a step back and look at what is in a belt. What are the key components in a belt that give it such great strength and longevity? And the three key parts that you see here are the tensile member, which is made of carbon fiber cord, the compound made of polyurethane, which holds the belt to the sprocket teeth and allows it to bend, and then the wear layer on the surface of that compound that touches the sprocket and also improves durability. And the most, one of the most important parts of that belt, the carbon fiber tensile cord. And this is really Gates's, I would say, our, our number one innovation in this space. Uh, we use carbon fiber cord. Why do we use carbon cord instead of Kevlar or, or steel or something else? Well, uh, you can see many of the reasons here. Uh, overall, that's what gives us the uh, extremely high durability and lifetime because it doesn't stretch, uh, it doesn't wear out over um, various loads, um, and very high strength to weight ratio enables us to fit a very small um, package constraint. So um, width and um, uh, yeah, um, and also it, it, it shows really high environmental resistance to water, to oil, and other contaminants. So um, high power density overall. Uh, this I just wanted to show you a little bit more data comparing um, belts of different sizes and pitches versus chains. This really applies to uh, scooters and uh, more uh, high power motorized um, motorcycles. But, but what you can see here is that um, an 11 millimeter pitch poly chain with a 15 millimeter wide uh, belt its, it's brake strength is so much stronger than the brake strength of many chains that are used on gas and electric scooters even. So handles the bike, the demands of the bike world very well as well. Uh, the next key Gates innovation that I wanted to point out is center track. And center track, um, center track was, was huge, a, a huge breakthrough for us because it allowed Gates Carbon Drive to be used on more and more uh, applications that saw off-road, um, applications that saw dirt and debris. It allowed our sprockets to get a little bit narrower, a little bit lighter, and overall increased the, the belt life um, because it's able to uh, allow debris to just pass right through the sprocket and also keep alignment. And uh, this is just a little bit of data behind um, some of that improvement, uh, comparing a center track belt drive system to non-center track belt drive system. We saw a, a huge increase in tensile strength, especially when subjected to high amounts of debris in our sand testing apparatus. Um, also an increase in, in uh, tooth shear um, resistance. Okay, so finally wrapping up part one, um, my, my last uh, message to you all is um, Gates Carbon Drive, uh, though we, we started in, in motorcycle 40 years ago, um, we've been very successful in, in bicycle over the last several years, 14 years and, and growing. We are also expanding beyond bicycles to 
more and more electric scooters, which is uh, a fast growing market in China and India, especially. Um, and you'll, you'll see us also on, on many electric motorcycles as well. So anyway, same technology that's used for bicycles, it's being applied to an, a growing power range of electric two wheelers. So with that, I would like to now hand it over to our keynote speaker of the day, Zach Kraffel. Um, Zach, uh, tell us, uh, yeah, w welcome, uh, and uh, w we are welcome your introduction and uh, explanation of new products. Hey, thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Um, well, uh, actually, Jonathan has probably got more words in this one than I do, so uh, I think you're more of the keynote than I am. Uh, what we are going to do today is, is go over the new products that we've got. Um, basically, uh, we, you know, have pretty humble beginnings uh, in the bicycle world, um, starting in the late 2000s, and uh, we we started in, in a in a very niche uh, market of single speeds and very high end uh, bicycles, and, and grew from there. And so our current portfolio um, is broadened um and it has been uh broadening for quite some time go, to, go ahead and go to the next slide there um we started with uh with a uh, a non-center track technology for for single speed and we broadened that to the to the cdx line basically we, we started to see the demand for a lot of expedition based uh touring and uh, people looking for a drivetrain that lasted quite a bit longer than than uh, they could get with a traditional chain. And, uh, and from there, we started to expand to, to accommodate uh, lower class point uh, vehicles. And uh, as electrification has occurred, these car alternatives have basically uh, enabled us to expand further. And so with, with electrification, we've, we've really enjoyed uh, a lot of uh, spec increase with OEs with uh, end consumers who don't want to deal with lubrication of chain and cleaning chains, et cetera, and basically uh, expand to a more reliable, uh, quieter vehicle than they had before. Um, so what we've got here is um, we have uh, three new expansions and three new uh, lines here. We've got a sidetrack on the left here. Um, this, is, this is something that uh, we've had a lot of requests on for for a few years, and that is a, an entry level price point, something that is for an analog bike, not an e-bike, um, that would be in the MSRP range of 300 to 700 euros or about 330 to 770 USD. It, um, it is a, it's a target for a more entry level commuter type bicycle, and it does not have a uh, center track. Basically, um, it relies on the same belt technology that we've got today, but we added uh, a new crank and a new uh, set of rear sprockets and modified our, our existing CDN belt today. So, so that's a, an important addition to our line. It is targeted towards single speed and uh, three speed internal gear hubs. Then we uh, have, we're excited to add this new line of CDC product. CDC is, is basically adding a brand new uh, center track next generation technology for the, for the uh, front sprockets as well as new rear sprockets on the CDC line. Those are targeted between, uh, they're targeted for analog bikes as well as low torque mid motors. So it's both an e-bike and an analog bike. Targeted price point is uh, 1,500 to 3,000 euros about, although we have seen interest in much higher price point uh, on the CDC side. That does utilize uh, center track. Uh, it improves uh, debris shedding, and it is targeted for single speed, all internal gear hubs, and it can, and is also appropriate towards the pinion gearbox system. And then on the CDX side, uh, we have expanded the EXP line, which is the Expedition line. We have uh, added some, some more sprockets, and we're targeting uh, different coatings on, on products to allow for an endurance level even higher than what we have today. Okay, Jonathan, go ahead. Okay, so focusing on the CDC. Basically, what we've got is um, CDC is targeting 
mid-motor systems of 50 newton meters or less. That's like the current Bosch Active Line or Active Line Plus, or the Shimano E5000 or 6100 uh, e-bike motors. We have uh, totally redesigned the, the uh, front sprocket. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the CDX line, you'll notice that the close-up of the CDC tooth profile shows a, a break between each tooth. And that, um, that allows us to create front sprockets that are uh, less expensive than CDX. It's one less machining operation and bring the, um, bring the product down to a slightly less uh, expensive option compared to CDX today. So pretty excited about that. We've developed 18 different spider assemblies for these different motors on different belt lines, uh, many different options there uh, across Bosch and, and Shimano. If there are um, other motors out there that we feel like we can target, uh, we add those spiders. We also, um, and one of the things that, that both business development and engineering do is consistently analyze new mid-motors, um, new product offerings from different uh, propulsion system providers, and look at the clearances with our existing spiders, the, the business case of how and when to, uh, to expand any type of line to those type of motors. So that's a, that's a super fun pro, uh, process in our development here. These particular sprockets are compatible and uh, recommended for use with the CDX center track belts. Okay, and then the rear sprocket. Uh, we have uh, expanded and improved the rear sprocket line. Again, these are for these are designed for 50 newton meters or less, um, and uh, they are approved for either CDX or CDN belts. Uh, and then highlighting again on the on the um, CDC e-bike motor and internal gear hub compatibility, 50 newton meters or less. There is no restriction based on a front hub motor or a rear hub motor. Um, the primary targets for the uh, for the mid motors are, are Bosch and Shimano Active Line, Active Line Plus, and, and E5000, E6100. And then on the internal gear hub side of things, we've got uh, both Shimano and NVLO. Uh, three speeds, seven, eight, and 11 on the Shimano side, and then any hub that Inviolo makes today would be compatible with, uh, with the CDC one. And then on the sidetrack system, um, so basically we started, um, started from the ground up. We, we talked with a, a, a number of different OEs about their needs, uh, target price points, and we created a, a whole new uh, forged uh, 6061 crank these, this particular system has uh, mud or debris shedding uh, incorporated into the design. It's a little bit different than center track, but the front crank has a flange on the left side and the right side, and so does the, the rear sprocket. And then the, um, the belt is the same technology as our CDN belt, just without the center track, uh, center flange. Um, and then on the, on the rear sprocket there, um, that is a uh, zinc uh, chromoly design. On the CDX side, we do have some new uh, expedition um, parts there that are coming out, as well as an expansion of some of the uh, CDX pieces, basically the first one we've got here. We had a, a number of different um, requests to be able to increase the life of roll-off internal gear hub. Um, products and, and the first line there, this is the RSSB line. This is a coated steel. We've got a 19, 20, and a 22 coming out. That um, steel has a significantly harder surface than our current CDX uh, stainless line. And the, the goal there again was to improve the life of a product in a, in a, in a long endurance environment. So uh, those products are available right now. Um, the 19 is uh, was available, uh, made available in May. 20 and 22 are coming out in July. Those are with the Chinese country of origin, and we are expanding for all of our European uh, OEs that might have COO issues. Uh, that line would be available in December of 2020. Um, next up, we've got a, on the expedition side, we've got uh, an SMN sprocket. 
we have a pretty broad um, number of tooth profiles for the SMN line, but we added one more. That was a 39 tooth. There's a big, uh, a big portfolio there um, in terms of sizes. On the uh, on the CDX side, we did add a 20 tooth SMB. That's a, that's also a, a black special coating on a stainless bracket. Uh, we have added um, a 50 by one threaded CDX rear sprocket for uh, specifically for a Sturmy Archer five speed. A number of different OEs have been looking at uh, adding this Sturmy hub inside of a rear hub motor. And that product is, is available now along with its paired uh, tool to remove the sprocket. And then we also expanded the uh, Shimano Inner 5 East uh, internal gear hub portfolio. We have a 28 and a 32 uh, currently, and the 30 is uh, now available as well. Um, and then on the front sprocket side, we did um, add a 39 tooth uh, stainless for the pinion side. So when we look at when we look at the sprocket technical comparison between uh, all the, the the whole line there, what we have uh, are various different cost options, and, and as you go from left to right, they they go from an entry level price point all the way to the most expensive. And, and basically, our our analysis is looking at different coatings, different materials, what is most appropriate for the bicycle or the vehicle that it is intended for, and those are all uh, appropriately uh, grouped together. So on the sidetrack side of things, our, our front sprockets are anodized 6061, and on the rear we've got uh, zinc-coated chromolines. Um, right now, sidetrack, we're looking at a 46, 50, and 60 tooth in the front, and a 20 and 22 in the back. And our availability for sidetrack is, is right now through a, a few um, expanded parts uh, by the end of July. CDN is an existing line. Those are all uh, available now. Um, CDN has a 46, 50, and 55 tooth in the front. That's a glass-filled nylon composite. And uh, those, are, again, are available now. Uh, CDC, this is, a, this is a launch that is um, expanding based on availability of, of new parts. And, and right now, what we've got is a 46, a 50, and a 55 in the front. And that launch is basically between now and August for, for OEs. On the rear, uh, we have 22 through 28 tooth uh, sprockets available, and, and they're all available right now. CDX, of course, is an existing line. That's, uh, those are all available now, and, the, and most of the CDX line are, are stainless um, and designed for the, the higher torque uh, mid-motors or the endurance bicycles. And then again on the CDX line, that uh, the CDX EXP line, the front sprockets on the EXP line are 7075 aluminum. That's a stronger material as well as a, a harder anodization uh, process there to make those last longer. And then rear, we've got the steel, the, the much harder steel than stainless uh, to, to increase the, the uh, endurance there. So the CDX side, the front, um, is the front sizes are 32 to 55, and then on the rear 19 to 39. Um, and then I should I should go back to the CDX side. The the, the CDX has by far the broadest uh, portfolio there. Uh, front tooth range 22 to 70, and rear 19 to 39. And then uh, as we compare the belts, we, we have three belts. And there's the side track, the CDN, and the CDX. The, the side track and the CDN are uh, identical. We have the, uh, the number of, the total number of tooth profiles are all the same. The only difference between those two is that the side track does not have the center track uh, groove function in it. And then on the CDX side, we've uh, we changed material to a polyurethane. All three have the carbon cord, um, but on the CDX side, we've got polyurethane, and and quite a number of belts between 108 teeth to 174. On the side track and CDN, those are only available in black. And then on the CDX side, we've got both black and blue. 
And the advancements on, on belts over the years uh, we, with our Gen 1, Gen 2, and Gen 3 carbon core generation of technology, we basically have, um, we have increased the tensile strength over time. You can see in the graph to the right there, um, we've got a considerable increase between uh, Gen 1 and Gen 2 and a, and a nominal increase on Gen 3. So we're, we're always looking to increase the, uh, the life of the belts as well as their as well as their strength, and pair that with all of the sprocket technology we've got coming out of there. And finally, um, we, something that we are seeing more and more of um, is requests for um, idler or tensioner development uh, with OEs. So many OEs have a vehicle in mind that they are that they are designing or developing. Some of which uh, are uh, full suspension, um, some of which are EMTBs, um, and they are looking for assistance from Gaiety. So basically, what we're what we're doing is um, helping to give guidelines to OEs in the beginning um, as 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 to how to best design for either an idler or a tensioner, um, and then expand that as needed. If if we have OEs that would like to have more of a cooperative uh, arrangement with the design, we're happy. To so some would prefer to do their own design, and some would prefer to have uh, more assistance. But basically, um, we have two different two different designs here. We've got idlers or tensioners. Idler is basically fixed um, and would be on a hardtail type of a bike without any rear uh, wheel movement or, or full suspension. Those idlers can be at the rear axle. They can be at the BB uh, or or uh, gearbox uh, center. Or they could be mounted on a chainstay. Um, this idler does uh, offer some flexible and simplified uh, frame integration in which uh, the dropouts could be uh, traditional dropouts, and you wouldn't need to have sliders in there. Now, on the on the uh, tensioner side of things, a tensioner is basically designed to to pair well with a mid motor or a mid gearbox. And if there is a full suspension rear wheel moving, the, the, the tensioner is designed to keep the tension of the belt consistent through the travel of the rear wheel. And it's, it's uh, a sprung design, and it is a little bit more complicated. Um, and so we, we have different designs that we've worked with in the past and, and can assist there as well. So this is something that we hear more and more um, requests for. We're also working on a possible open source uh, gates tensioner system and, and idler. Um, so look for that in the future as well. So um, I think that's about it here. Um, if we can ask, uh, look at the uh, look at the different questions. It does. I just am looking here. It looks like some people have had no sound. Some people have had sound. Um, yeah, so it looks like there were just a, a couple. Sorry, Zach. Looks like just a couple had some issues with sound, so um, got a couple of them working, a couple not so much. But um, okay. that's okay. Y'all's presentation was very descriptive. It sounds like so they were able to at least follow along, and then we'll be posting the recording at that okay. go.gates.com/slash/recorded/webinars page where people can view it later. So, other than that, I didn't see too many questions. So if y'all have questions, please type them into the chat or the Q and A. And in the meantime, Jonathan and Zach, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts you want to put out as we wait and see if any more questions come in. Yeah, I would say, you know, from our standpoint, um, we, uh, this was a, this was a little bit of a shotgun approach to give a lot of information, um, in a short period of time. For those of you that are less, um, familiar with, uh, some of our products and, and or some of the content in here, um, I went through a lot of different uh, internal gear hub options, those kind of things. If you're not familiar with those, you can contact either of us, um, and uh, we can we can disseminate a lot of information for you. Yeah, and um, looks like we have one question from the audience. Any thoughts on future trends on e-bikes, such as? integration of gears i think that means integration of gears into the motor yeah yeah so that's a really good question and and something that's that's on our mind 
we we basically have uh, a list of uh, competent automotive tier ones as well as uh, bicycle industry tier ones that are um, ever changing their e-bike portfolios and and one of the things for for gates that's really important is, is the ability to um, seamlessly integrate this drivetrain and we we do see that a long term um, a long-term success for us is when a, an e-bike mid-motor or an analog bike that, that doesn't have assistance has a gearbox at the cranks. And those particular solutions that will be coming out are um, really going to enable Gates to have uh, our drivetrain specced with OEs across the globe much easier than it is today. So we have our, we have our um, barriers right now and and we see those being eliminated as as people migrate towards a, a mid motor with a gearbox or, or a gearbox at the cranks. hey um zach another question which oes are the popular ones ah so that's uh that depends on where you are on the globe but basically there's uh there's five big ones in in europe that uh are probably about um Oh, 70% of our our uh, our business today. Um, we have uh, we have groups uh, called POM and Excel Group, as well as ZEG in Germany. Uh, we have, um, of course, our our, our um, different OEs are split between our distribution partner, as well as some that are that are direct to Gates. On the on the U.S. side, of course, there's the behemoths like uh, like Specialized and Trek or CSG, um, but we do have a pretty broad um, portfolio of OEs out there, and and, uh, and just a fabulous relationship with our distributor, UT in in Europe that uh, that is indispensable. Mm. Hey Zach, another question about cargo electric bikes. I know you you. I just, we showed that picture in the very beginning of, of one of the most recent cargo e-bikes you designed. And I know you've been following this topic for years. Uh, what do you see as the future of uh, cargo electric bikes and trends that you see in this space? So cargo, cargo is interesting because it, uh, the barrier to entry to, for a cargo bike is uh, considerably less than something like a uh, a light electric vehicle or a, or a you know sprinter van or something like that. It also represents a, a huge opportunity for uh, logistics uh, and operations of, um, of delivering goods in urban areas to be reduced. So the uh, the ability for people to deliver these goods with a cargo bike is often much easier than it is with a traditional sprinter van. Um, and it's also a lot cheaper. So what we're seeing is a lot of cargo bikes coming on online in both the U.S. and Europe, um, and, and these are direct replacements for uh, a larger vehicle. And um, the operations and maintenance reduction of a cargo bike alone allow for uh, a, uh, a very easy transition to a totally different vehicle. And so that's um, that's something that we are pretty successful with, and people who are creating these vehicles are looking for a drivetrain that is uh, maintenance-free. Great. I see a question um, come in here, guys, through the chat from Andy Bell. He's talking about the sidetrack system and wants to know what internal gear hubs is that compatible with? So that's a um, that's basically designed for a single speed as well as um, Three speed hubs, and we're we are limited in expanding um, to larger internal gear hubs based on it's basically just a geometry issue. We we cannot expand that to uh, larger range hubs based on the on the geometry of those hubs. But three speed, no problem. Uh, Zach, another question here. What is driving the cost difference between belts and chains? Is this production of the belt 
or more the economies of scale which chains have over belts? Um, that's a good question. The, the belt construction is considerably more expensive than a chain. Um, Chains uh, are, uh, you know, stamping and forging processes, and and, uh, and the assembly of a chain is is pretty pretty op, uh, automated. It's actually a, it's an amazing process. If anybody ever has the chance to see a chain made, it's fantastic to watch. Um, the uh, carbon belt construction is a little bit more labor intensive. It's uh, it's a molding process, and it. Um, it does take more time, um, but the, uh, the the total the longevity of the drive train is, is vastly improved compared to chains. Another question, Zach: Which are the strength points of Gates versus the other competitors like OptiBelt and Continental? And why are polyurethane belts seem to be better than rubber? What are the pros and cons? Well, let's see. On the uh, Continental is no Continental used to be a direct competitor of Gates uh, on the on the bicycle side, and, and they pulled out about uh, oh, what was that about a year, fourteen months ago, um, and and OptiBelt has not been a uh, direct competitor on the on the bicycle side. What we do have um, is clear technology differentiation with center track and, and the ability to keep belt alignment uh, with our with our uh, patented center track. That is the that is the the main delineator there. Belt construction it's very important for the belt not to stretch. We do not want uh, to have OEs have to adjust the belt tension over time, and the carbon cord there um, really does. Uh, Help with that. Um, polyurethane compared to rubber, you know, I, I wish uh, we had um, Todd on here. He could probably uh, add <laughs> this as well. But, but basically, Todd, Todd I think we can do here. that. Yeah, I can yeah. take him off right. if you want to put him <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> yeah, well, Todd, you want to you want to add to this with basically polyurethane? Well, he can't say no right now because he's on mute. <laughs> Todd, I'm going to unmute you right now. So if you got any background uh, noise or something, go ahead and mute yourself real quick. So. Here you go. No, yeah. Not a, yeah, not a problem. Um, it, I think it has a lot to do with just the natural chemistry of urethane, that it's highly resistant to aging, natural um, ozone resistance, and oxidation that's um, superior to most of the engineered um, elastomers. A lot of times we'll say rubber is kind of a generic way of, of referring to a lot of the, the engineered elastomer materials that we have. And we use, obviously, some of the best um, materials like HNBR, which are designed for automotive applications. So they're very durable at high temperature, high mileage applications. And we've adapted those constructions for bicycles. But even using the best engineered um, elastomers, urethane is still um, the best material for aging and for durability. It's just an incredible, incredible material. Definitely a little bit more expensive. Um, but um, highly durable. All right. Well, thanks, Todd, and everybody there. And uh, I guess, well, um, Diego Pacetto, I just saw another one come in. He's saying uh, about the competition. You mentioned Continental used to be a direct competitor, but isn't anymore. Is there anybody else to be on the lookout for that you want to mention here? Oh, I think uh, I think we would definitely have a competitor on the horizon. It's uh, it's you know we would probably be surprised uh, if they came out tomorrow. However, it's always on our discussion list uh, that, that competitors will come on board. Um, so we're, it's something we're anticipating, but um, so far we don't have any targets, the specific targets of who they may be. Mm-hmm. And I guess the last couple of questions that I see right here, um, just in general, we have a lot of folks on from Gates that are sales reps all over the world, either automotive division, industrial division, or otherwise. And the question I don't really know how to answer, how do we go to market with these? Is there a carbon drive group that works specifically with distributors? Is it something in general 
And if it's something in general that guys can go out there and talk to people about uh, marketing flyers or anything like that, we can share with them information pamphlets, anything like that. Yeah, so there's two there's two basic avenues here, and, and there's the traditional bicycle uh, industry market, and, and by and large, um, bicycle OEs know how to get it in, in touch with us. Um, and then there's also non-bicycle folks, whether they are um, their current motorcycle industry or automotive industry, and they typically will contact us through the automotive side. Or we will we will uh, get contact from the automotive side into the carbon drive division, and uh, that seems to work out. However, there are new startups um, that that occur on a weekly basis of people asking. Um, they have heard of carbon drive before, and they get that through our through our website. Um, so there's, in general, we've had a pretty uh, pretty good success rate of, of uh, communicating with, uh, you know, either existing OEs or, or automotive-based OEs and then, and then startups. However, um, there's probably a lot of opportunity out there with people who are um, in communication with uh, our existing reps, and, and if we need to give them a list uh, or, a, or a PDF of, of who to contact on the carbon drive side, we'd be happy to do that. Great. And uh, the information pamphlets or flyers, anything like that, do we have those out there? Or maybe if not, that's something I can look at working with uh, Mike. Um, I, or Mary Ann, I think you're on too. You might be able to yeah. answer that. But is there anything we can add? Yeah, she yeah. just made that live yesterday. Are you on, Mary Ann? Yeah. Yeah, I'll see if I can yeah. take her off. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, hey, the uh, website is, up, is updated. Oh, yeah, Mary Ann, feel free to chime in. <laughs> Sure. Um, the website is gatescarbondrive.com, and um, we do have a lot of different resources available there, um, including some training videos, and then in resources, we have our tech manuals, e-bike manuals, product um, uh, guide, all sorts of different materials, as well as a blog with um, lots of different experiences from people who have used the Gates Carbon Drive system. Excellent. And I guess one more question I see from Jimmy Ferguson to wrap up, just kind of a good question out there. Do we have any belts that are in like competitive bike racing? I know personally I watch like the World Cup racing and all of that. And I know a lot of chains, but single speeds or anything like that, what do we do around competitive world? I missed the first part of that. Can you, can you repeat? Yeah, just any belts in like a competitive bike racing environment. I've seen Gates cycling kits, any teams that we work with or anything like that with this product. Yeah, we've done we've done a number of different um teams in the past. Uh there's there's some in Europe as well. Uh there's there was a, a pretty cool example of um uh, some some track bikes in uh in Germany where they had a team that, that had uh belted track bikes. Um and uh, we have sponsored uh, single speed as well as internal gear hub uh, teams in the past. Uh, I think Jonathan might be able to, to nod towards any, any future plans on that, but we do have quite a few uh, competitive, uh, very high end bikes that are equipped with belt and, uh, and there's lots of opportunities to, to uh, put those head to head with a chain based bike. And I would also add that um, you know, you have to keep in mind when you're talking about Tour de France racing, that kind of thing, those cyclists are looking for a super lightweight and very fast bike with lots of speed, um, um, lots of gear range. And with a belt drive system, you do have to have an internally geared hub. So that typically provides, it adds some weight to the system that um, cyclists, uh, such as in the Tour de France, are looking to avoid. So uh, that's I would believe the main reason you're not seeing belts in that type of racing. Yeah, well, great input, everybody. And thanks, Marianne and Todd, for your guest appearances here. Uh, good last question I see coming in here about future trends, I guess, and we can wrap it up after this since we're right at the top of the hour, but from uh, Lawrence Mendez. Do you know about uh, kind of projections for growth on this? Like what is the share right now of belt versus chain? And do we expect the belts? Obviously we're hoping that they become much more accepted by the manufacturers. Any ideas about where this is going in the future? 
So um, from our largest uh, OEs in Europe, the, the percentage of uh, beltification on their line is basically increasing over time. So uh, in the beginning, what, what a lot of OEs would do is, is they would find a, a, a specific model that they would like to try belt out with, and they uh, have had a lot of success with that, and that's that's expanded. So we what we found in Europe, especially on the e-bike side of things, uh, anywhere from 35 to all the way up to 100% of their line is is belted. In general, um, over time, we see uh, 35 to 55% of a line being uh, belted is is our target. Um, we're lucky to have a few OEs that want 100% of their bikes belted. Um, but right now, that trend is uh, is rising, and and, um, and you know we we would be thrilled to have 50 percent spec on all OEs. That would be amazing. Great. Well, thanks, guys. And real quick, there was one last one came in, so again from Diego Facetto. Thanks, Diego, for keeping the question and answer session going here. Um, what's the main color of the belts? Is there uh, a specific color they have to be, or can they be made to order if a specific customer wants a specific um, belt? Yeah, we we uh, we used to have more color options. We had a, a white, red, um, blue. We uh, made some custom colors uh, for people. We also made one with uh, without a color called the Bourbon Belt for uh, for, our, for a nod to Kentucky. Um, the, the issue there is that we are. Um, we're having a hard time um, being able to accommodate a lot of those different colors and keep the production line up. So every time you add a different color, it it slows down the line. And so right now we have uh, reduced it on the CDX line to black and blue. Um, and if a customer came along and they wanted a specific color and the volume was high enough, I think we could uh, we could. Uh, take a look at it and see if we could accommodate. But right now, we're just trying to keep up with uh, demand and reduction of the number of colors is helping. All right. Well, thanks, Zach. That's a uh, great discussion. Thanks, everyone, for your questions there. Certainly, I learned a whole lot. Jonathan, thanks for, again, your help here and putting all this together. And Marianne, Todd, everybody else on. Um, very exciting to see this growing line, learn more about it. As we wrap up here, I just sent one last time in the chat the link where all of these recorded webinars are getting posted. So uh, give us a couple days on this one, but we'll get it posted to that go.gates.com slash recorded webinars page. Uh, share that with anybody, uh, customers, end users, friends, family, whoever uh, you want to share info with. Uh, that's, that's the place to share the webinars. So with that being said, I'll say thanks one more time to our panelists here today. Thanks to our audience, and um, hopefully we can talk to you again soon. Sounds great. Thank you all. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you. Have a good one. Take care.